I'm happy to introduce to you our first panelist, Karen Sung, who just sit right beside me here. Um, Karen is an environmental and social activist. Currently, she works as the executive director of the Toronto chapter of Chinese Canadian National Council. I would refer you to read the more detailed bio in the program for Karen's activism work and her other achievements. But I, I would like to add here that Karen is also one of the organizers of the Youth Coalition Against McLean's Two Asian, along with another one of our panelists, Florence Lee, who sits beside Karen, um, who is to speak later. The Youth Coalition uses Facebook as a medium to galvanize supports from students and communities to address the two Asian issue with McLean's. Um, Karen and Florence didn't know that, but it is from following the activities of the Youth Coalition on the Facebook that I came to realize that the two Asian issue is bigger than just Asian issue. It has implication for all racial minority groups in Canada. And Karen is going to speak on the topic, McLean's as history repeating itself and how to make systemic change. So with that, I give the floor and time to you, Karen. Thanks for the invitation, and it's good to see so many people out here on a cold day. Um, so thanks for coming. I don't have a lot of pre-planned notes or presentations, so I'm going to speak a bit off the cuff, and hopefully people will cut me off when I run out of time. Um, I'm going to try not to speak too much so that there's more time for questions. Um, but I tend to ramble, so let's just get to it. Um, You've probably many of, pe of the people in here have read the McLean's article, so I won't get too much into that, and I think some of the other panelists are going to be talking more about that um, and maybe breaking it down. But I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that bothered me about it. One is um, that they perpetuated Asian stereotypes, that you know they perpetuated the idea of the mi model minority, and often when you talk to people about the McLean's issue and they don't understand the problem of using stereotypes. They'll say, well, you know, it's a positive stereotype and it's great that, you know, you're seen as hardworking and blah, blah, blah. But the problem with the McLean's article is it's saying <coughs> you're too hardworking. So you can't even get ahead even if you work hard, right? Because what they're saying is they're working so hard that they're making it too difficult for other people, so we're going to hold them back anyways. Um, so that was really frustrating for me. Um, and also the idea of Asians as a perpetual foreigner, as someone who is Canadian born, um, and I know people in the Chinese community who are third and fourth generation, um, whose grandfathers and great grandfathers helped to build the railroad that put this country together, or helped to make this country what it is. It's very frustrating for them to see themselves portrayed as foreigners, that you know, they will never be Canadian enough for some people uh, in this country. So, so it becomes a very personal thing. Um, and I think also this happened right after uh, the election. I ran in the last election um, in the city of Toronto and you know, was a fairly strong candidate, I thought, a uh, progressive candidate. Um, and there was the established progressive people in the camp who decided that they needed to run someone against me. So I had Jack Layton's son running against me. So it was a, another sort of example of it doesn't matter how hard you work or how hard you try, there will always be someone else with more connections or more influence or whatever um, trying to take your place. So, or trying to. Um, they'll always be ahead of you in line somehow. Um, that because you're a visible minority, because you're not part of the old boys club um, and they don't want you there, um, that you're always one step behind. And it's very frustrating. And it's very frustrating to feel like, yet again, you're being put in your place. Um, and so um, this McLean's issue came up. And I think the, the issue was, um, people were offended. A lot of people were calling for an apology. 
Um, and there was some debate in the community as to whether or not we'd be able to get an apology and whether or not we should ask for more, or ask for less, or why are we asking for an apology and are we being too sensitive and maybe it's not such a big deal. Um, but I think for me, it's not um, just the words that they say, it's the implication of those words, right? Because um, historically we have seen that that these words have policy implications, that there, that um, we felt that this article by McLean's may have been like a trial balloon. Like, let's float this idea out there and see what happens. And if people don't react to this, then maybe, maybe if no one reacted to this, then maybe universities down the road would think about putting quotas on the number of Asians or the number of black people or the number of, you know, whoever, whoever it was that they felt was messing with the way things should be. Um, and so that's problematic. And some people would say, well, maybe you're just being paranoid and that would never happen. But we look at the history of racism in Canada and we see that um, after uh, Chinese railroad workers helped to build the railroad in 1885 and the last spike was put in that they also in that same year started the Chinese head tax because the work of the Chinese people was done and we didn't really want them in Canada anymore so we were going to charge them a head tax if they wanted to come into this country um, and they raised the head tax a couple of times um, and I think it reached $500 in the early 1900s um, but they were still coming into this country. So they changed a policy, an immigration policy, um, called the Chinese Exclusion Act, and basically stopped all Chinese people from coming into Canada at all um, until after the Second World War. Um, a number of Chinese Canadians did fight in the war, and it was seen after the war that you know maybe we're, we weren't so bad and we could learn to integrate into Canadian society or whatever the thought was. Anyways, that stopped in 1947, um, immigration from China was allowed, was opened up again. Um, but the apology for that governmental, like that discriminatory policy by the Canadian government uh, wasn't given until 2006. And then campaign for an apology happened um, right after the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was was um, established. So they started the campaign for a head tax apology in 1983. So it was a 23 year campaign before they got an apology from the federal government for that. Um, in 1979, um, which a lot of people have been comparing um, this, uh, an incident in 1979 with CTV, uh, they have a program called W5 and there was an episode called Campus Giveaway where they talked about foreigners taking over uh, Canadian universities. So it's exactly the same issue as what McLean's is talking about, that these Asians are taking over our campus and we need to do something about that because, you know, they're not supposed to be there or, you know, like there's something wrong with the fact that there are so many Asians now taking over these campuses. Um, so in 1979, uh, there was uh, a lot of, there were a lot of people that were upset about this and there were protests across Canada um, demanding an apology from, from W5, from, from the TV station. And they eventually did get an apology. They actually took to the streets and did a whole mass protest um, and one of the reasons they were able to get that apology was because, first of all, there were a lot of factual errors in the W5 uh, campus giveaway. I think campus giveaway was way worse than McLean's was. I think McLean's is much more subtle um, in the way they've, they've written it. Um, but, you know, the issues were similar and, and the problems were similar. Um, now we, we have been asking McLean's for an apology, but I feel that the apology is just the beginning, right? Because we can see that, you know, W5 gave an apology and 
30 years later, we have the exact same issue with a different media outlet. So nothing has really <coughs> changed, that that anti-Asian sentiment is still out there. So if we don't want to keep fighting the same fight over and over again, we have to make a more systemic change. Um, and a number of us got together and we were talking back and forth and everything happened very quickly. I think with um, social media and the internet and, and everything, everything happened very quickly. There were a number of meetings the week after the McLean's article came out. Um, 30 years ago with W5, they had their first meeting a month and a half after that episode aired. So the speed at which um, people are able to mobilize now is very different. Um, and I think people are s more savvy in a lot of different ways. So uh, we have not been able to get an apology from McLean's, but we have been able to open up a discussion about some of the broader issues. We've talked to a lot of people on a lot of different campuses, and we've talked about why is this happening? And one of the things that we've been talking about is the fact that there isn't really an Asian Canadian studies program anywhere. You don't really learn about Asian Canadian history in high school or university, or there are very few opportunities to do that. So this idea that Asians are the perpetual foreigner, I think it's easy for a lot of people to forget that we've been here for 150 years because we don't learn about that, we don't talk about that. Um, so there's been talk of maybe trying to create an Asian Canadian Studies program or somehow include that into curriculum or include that into um, um, other high school or university curriculums. I think um, also talking with people on campus and professors on campus who are able to design courses. There's, I think, a couple of professors in BC now who are taking this McLean's issue and the two Asian issue and um, creating courses around this. So there's one professor in, I think, UBC who is basically created a course where students are required to do some kind of activist work around this issue as part of their course requirements. So there are creative things like that that are happening on campus. And I think um, even just the discussions that we're having on campus, like um, the conversation that we're having here today, um, but also having similar conversations across different campuses and that those conversations are, um, are able to continue online, I think is very different from uh, how things were organized back in 1979. Um, I do think, um, and I guess Florence will be talking a bit about this, is um, there is a concern that People are a bit lazy and like to click things on their, on their internet and don't always come out. And at the end of the day, you need people to sign petitions, you need people to organize events, you need people to come to rallies, um, otherwise nothing will change, right? Like systemic change takes a long time and it, it's work. Um, but I think if there are enough people who want to see that change happen, then it'll happen. And I think the big part of it is finding like-minded people and finding your allies and, and pushing in the places where, where you can, where you do have some power, right? So um, I'm going to leave it at that, and I welcome your questions later on. Um, hopefully, we'll have a good discussion. So thanks again for inviting me.